Today I'm on Normanby Island, a little bit off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And you can see in the background there that most of the vegetation is full primary rainforest. But this area here is a distinct vegetation anomaly. The trees are much shorter, there's hardly any cover on the surface, and there's some kind of unusual plants. And the reason for that is exposed in the track a few hundred metres down that way. The answer is here. At first glance, it might just look like an altered siltstone or perhaps a calcilicate hornfels. You can see what looks like bedding in there. But the clue is in this network fracture pattern that you can see cutting through it with a characteristic V and a rib in the center of silica. And that tells you it's an ultramafic, partially on the way to serpentinite. In other places in drier climates, that continues and the center parts weather out to leave a characteristic open boxwork gossam. I've got another video about that up here somewhere. Sorry, I've got another video about that up here somewhere. <laughs> Here's an example here that's really typical of the kind of texture you find in gossans after serpentine minerals and ultramafic rocks. Lots of big open cavities with boxworks that are formed by frameworks of fine grained, even chalcedonic silica and holes in the middle that are made from leaching of carbonate altered serpentine minerals. Let's take a closer look at that fracture pattern. In this area here, you can see that characteristic random network of fractures. And in this piece here, you see that central rib with a, a cavity running either side of it. That's absolutely typical of ultramafix cut by serpentinite veins and then weathered out on either side. And I'll just wet this broken piece here. And you can see that classic random network of fractures with serpentinite minerals on the fractures and relics of the ultramafic in between. And here's another piece here where you can see that absolutely typical network fracture pattern with serpentine minerals on the sides of the fractures and then a valley down either side of the serpentine minerals. It's particularly obvious over there you can see that valley either side of the serpentine and then the relics of the ultramafic in the orange. Now one of the things about ultramafics is they're very high in iron, so they make what looks like really good soil. But most plants really struggle to get nutrients out of that soil. So there's only a few specialised plants that can thrive in that environment. In Australia, it's Xantheria, and I've made a little video that talks about that up here. Now one of the clues you can use to guess that this might be after an ultramafic rock, if you're in Australia, is that thing. Grass trees, species of Xantheria. They just love the chemistry of soils that develop on top of ultramafic rocks. But here it's pitcher plants. These ones are from the genus Nepenthes, which contains more than a hundred species. They can survive in poor soils because they're carnivorous. The lid secretes a sweet smelling nectar that attracts the insects. If they stray into the pitcher below, a slippery ribbed lip with microscopic downward facing hairs makes sure that it's a one-way trip. Nutrients are particularly scarce in places where the ultramafics or serpentinites have developed a lateritic weathering profile. This pitcher plant is growing right next to an outcrop of ultramafic rock and the surrounding soil is piezolytic laterite. And ultramafics can have a variety of mineralization associated with them nickel, chrome, platinoids, and in some cases copper. So if you're working in a really tropical environment and you see an unusual vegetation anomaly, particularly with plants that can survive without much nutrients, take a look around and see if you can find some ultramafics or the serpentinites after the ultramafics.